Here we are, packet six, class number two. Uh, we're going to get into free body diagrams. I mean, that's the basic idea for the next couple of weeks, but we'll get to a lot of, not tangents, a lot of things that need to be talked about in order to understand free body diagrams. I mean, it's, yeah, it's a bunch of arrows, but all right. So the class is done with three and four. By the time we get done today, we should at least do homework, have the front of 6.1 done. Uh, we spent all our time talking about three and four in class because of all the lift and the drag and all that, which we'll do here too. But as far as virtual, I'm just saying, keep up for now. And then you're probably gonna, yeah, I'm gonna have you all hand in or submit your, um, your 6.1, which you're working on now. And that's gonna be worth probably I don't know, 30 points, something like that. And as to when it's worth, when it's turned in, I don't know. Okay, last time, now I think we're, when I'm interviewing uh, my students, I'll interview you guys. So last time, I'll turn this can, I'll turn the uh, recorder off. But last time we talked to Bennett, he agreed to, um, now Bennett, um, because you agree, I don't know what I said, but let's go 10 points, 10 Zoom points you get. Uh, put that in your packet six, so that on the cover you make sure you add in the 10 points if you got interviewed. Um, so who wants to get interviewed now? I'm gonna pause the recording. Um, tomorrow is uh, SAT. So we'll do our 110 to two o'clock tomorrow, but we're gonna do a thing on, I wanna watch a thing with you guys on uh, fluid dynamics. Cause we're talking about fluid dynamics today. So, um, and tomorrow as well. So it'll be like a, you don't have to sit and watch it, but I think it would help. Uh, it's a pretty good video. All right, so <clears throat> this was your, your homework was to try number four. Uh, we did number three, I'll blow this up a little bit. We did number three in class. Uh, today we're gonna concentrate on, um, we're gonna concentrate on air drag, uh, force of lift. We'll talk a little bit about the force of static friction. We'll get a formula on that. And we'll even come into the normal force. So all those forces we're gonna pick up today and go through some more details on them in different orders. So looking at number four, this will help us. I'm gonna go orange for X and then blue for Y. Now on all of these, as a matter of fact, you, this is all the same car. So you can go ahead on each of these and just go ahead and put the MG because the mass of the car isn't gonna change. The um, the gravity of the earth isn't gonna change. So these are all just MG down. Gives you, kind of like bingo, you get that freebie. So MG, MG, okay, in the Y. The Y is not very, the Y is not, well, it's a little more interesting today. Uh, okay, so over to this, back to four now. Now five and six are gonna be homework for you to try those. Uh, so tomorrow, well, no, we Thursday, we'll look at those. Oh. If you're a junior and you're coming tomorrow, don't bring your phone. Uh, my job um, is to um, crack down on phone use. So if uh, I gotta go take your phone away from you, that's gonna be fine. All right, taking your phone away from a teenager. <laughs> I'll wear my combat gear. So anyway, uh, number four says now speeding up from 60 miles an hour to 120 miles an hour at the snapshot is at 80 miles an hour, but that's important. So I didn't say how fast we're speeding up, but we do know that if we're speeding up, my force of push, which is a Newton's third law reaction to the highway, my force of push is long. Um, and then there's a force of friction back. Now, uh, uh, first we'll talk about RA. RA, air drag is going to be longer. So whatever, however long you made it in number three, Make it about 20% longer in number four, all right, make it bigger. Okay, and the reason is air drag goes up as the square of velocity. Now let's go back to this, oh, hold on. 
like I say, I got, I, I put about a hundred of these little ideas I've had on here and I didn't know what we're going to, I want the discussion to be organic, right? In first hour, whatever comes up, comes up, whatever questions they ask. Um, and so these are sort of haphazard, but I'm putting them, when I do the screenshots, I'll try and put them all together. So one thing we talked about was this Tame and Paula um, album cover, and it's a good album. It's got some good stuff on there. But what I love about the most is the this graphic design because it shows laminar flow. All right, this is all laminar flow, uh, parallel lines, um, but then behind the ball, and I'm so that you can think of this as a ball sitting there, and then there's fluid flowing, and this fluid looks like it's oily, right? It's got a little viscosity to it. And behind it, you see um, the vortexes, you see the turbulent flow, okay? That's really the essence of fluid dynamics is laminar versus turbulent and all the complications that occur in turbulent flow and how that affects the direction the thing's going, the speed it's going, the amount of air drag it has on it, and that's really what you're doing when you're trying to design a car and minimize air drag, you're looking at fluid dynamics. And so you're looking at what's called turbidity currents or little eddy currents in the, in the, behind the car. Um, okay. So we'll get to that in a minute, Bernoulli's. All right, let's talk about though this first and uh, let me erase some stuff. Thought I had this thing cleaned up. Okay, this is the formula for air drag as we've shown before, but now we're gonna get serious about it. And you, yes, you, you will get your notes. So you wanna write stuff down, but you don't need to write this word for word, maybe jot it out and make little, because you're gonna get this. This is gonna be on the, if not the next equation sheet, it'll be on the equation sheet after. So it's coming to you and you'll have it on the, you'll even, it'll have it on 6A and 6B, the equation sheets. But, um, okay, let's go through this. Uh, it's a function, it's a function of velocity, not a function of time. It's one of the first times we've had a formula that's not kinematic, it's not related to time. Um, in, indirectly it is, I mean, it's V squared. And the other thing is this formula, uh, someone asked, uh, do we need to derive this on a test? Is it weird to go through? And the answer is no, because it's not derivable. Some formulas in physics, you cannot derive with algebra or with calculus or with geometry. The reason is that it's too complicated. Um, there are formulas in, um, in fluid mechanics, but if you watched that video yesterday that I put in the comments, I'm adding any, like if you're, if you're serious about physics or you're serious about engineering and you wanna better yourself beyond what the classroom can do, then start watching those videos I'm putting in the comments below the screenshots. And I put two really good, one of the second video I put on there that for the, for the, uh, the last video that's on there, that we're gonna to watch tomorrow together. Well, then I can stop and discuss it. But this, the video after the wrap up, that one's got some really good formulas in there. Once it's a little bit beyond our course, uh, it's fluid dynamics, but I think it's a good idea to watch that. Anyway, um, in that part of what they do talk about is, is drag. Um, it could be water, water drag, this form does not work. People, students try to apply this when I'm looking at things falling through water. It doesn't work. This only works in air or really like pretty much air, right? Because uh, not a vacuum, but in regular air and air, we had, I had two students measure the room today at lunch. They volunteered and I gave them some points on, but they volunteered to measure the room and see how, how much the room weighs. The air is, air is thick. Uh, the density of air is, let's write this down. The density of air here, it's in kilograms per cubic meter. It's 1.2 kilograms per cubic meter. And that's air in, in the surrounding me right now. Uh, the density of 14.7 pounds per square inch, that air. I'm not talking about the air on the top of Mount Everest. That, that may be 0.9 kilograms per cubic meter because there's not as much air molecules up there because of gravity. The atmosphere is basically soup. 
you walk around in this soup. It's all thick at the bottom and thin at the top. Um, so we can breathe it in. Well, that's density of air. So when you say rho in, in the formula for air drag, you mean the medium that, you're, that it's traveling through. Uh, if it is um, liquid, it ends up becoming natural log stuff. And so that's, a, that's, we're not gonna, that's beyond our course. That's AP physics. Chapter six. Uh, the D stands for drag coefficient. Now drag coefficient, and I showed the kids in class, the drag coefficients, you look up in books. Uh, I showed them the guide, the handbook of chemistry and physics, it's like that thick. Um, and it, uh, that thick there. And it's like 80 bucks. And we, had, before the internet, back in the 90s, we bought a copy for every student. Student versions were like $40. And then they would spend a lot of time with that book, looking stuff up, always looking up drag coefficients, looking up, you know, because it's just table after table after table. Um, and so that's what you look up in a book. This, this comes from, this part of it comes from chemistry. Uh, chemistry shapes somewhat, but mostly it's chemistry, surface chemistry. Uh, the surface molecules, and that was in the video yesterday as well, but there's this layer of surface molecules around an object and how that interacts as part of the drag coefficient. So you could spend the rest of your life, you could go become a mechanical engineer and spend the rest of your life just looking at this drag coefficient. Because if an airline, if Boeing can find a better paint to use, um, and I'll show you some animations of, they, they do all this study of air wind tunnel of like wheels when they come down from 747s or uh, cars, of course, but looking at all the turbidity. And if you could reduce the D, if you could find a way to drop that by 10%, you would drop air drag by 10%, and therefore you're gonna get a lot more out of your fuel. And so you'd become a very rich person, I think, if you could patent that. Anyway, so that's drag coefficient. Uh, we'll leave it at just chemistry now. Um, we'll talk about a little bit of chemistry uh, later on. Uh, rho, we said, was the density of the air, usually around 1.2. Oh, so I was talking about the room. So I had two students that measured the room. They measured the cubic meters of the room. And so they took the tiles. Each tile is one foot by one foot in my room. Measured the height, multiplied it all together. Got a, got 12,000. Oh, my room at school is 12,000. It's the biggest, one of the biggest classrooms at Norman High. It's 12,000 cubic feet. And if you take that, it's about 340 cubic meters, multiply that by 1.2, the room, and then multiply by 2.2 that, the room ends up, the air in my room at school, if you're familiar with room 807, the air in that room weighs close to a thousand pounds. So we think of air as weightless because we, we're surrounded by it, right? But it's very heavy. If I went into a place and then, and then bottled up all the air in my room, and then tried to lift it 900, 900 and some odd pounds, close to a thousand pounds. Um, so air is heavy, there's a lot of it there. Air at sea level. Uh, now this A stands for profile area. So if I were to, let's say drop, um, drop this iPad, all right. So if I, the school sponsored iPad here. If I were to drop this iPad, and I drop it this way, to hit the ground, then the profile area is this. All of this is my profile area. But if I drop it this way, so it's so now this is the only exposure. The, this becomes the profile area. So there's much less drag when I drop an iPhone this way and therefore more damage when it hits the ground than if I drop it this way. Uh, because here I've gained a lot more air, air um, area, profile area. Now, if the iPhone falls this way, then it be, then the area is a function of time, and that becomes much more complicated. But we're not going to worry about that. Um, so that's what I mean by pro. I don't mean surface area. I don't mean what's called wettable area. I mean the profile area. So if a rocket's coming at you, the last thing you'll see on a rocket is a circle. That is the profile area. Okay, you don't see the fuselage. So it's important to realize that. So a parachute, like a parachute, opens up. 
that's got a huge amount of, that's the A is maximized. You want to make it so that your velocity when you hit the ground is about 15 feet a second. No more than that. Um, and then the, uh, okay, so then, then, then the velocity is squared. So the velocity, if I were to plot, if I were to plot RA versus V, this is important uh, when you get to these free body diagrams to know like how big is my RA? Well, RA versus V, it goes up parabolically. So that's why in this uh, drawing, your RA should be, because it's going 20 miles an hour faster, your RA should be bigger quite a bit than this RA, okay? Oh, okay, and we gotta talk about one more thing on that. So while we're on the subject of RA, let's talk about terminal velocity. It's one of those things you gotta know. So terminal velocity, I'm gonna skip over to the, let's go right to the formula. There's the form, write that formula down. Now you'll get this, you'll get this on a sheet as well. But write that formula down, and then I want you to tell me, how do we go from RA equals one half D rho A V squared to this for the, for the equation for terminal velocity. Terminal velocity is uh, when I drop something, eventually it'll stop accelerating. It accelerates at 9.81 in a vacuum, but in air, all that air can't get out of the way. And so the air pushes back, Newton's third law. And eventually that, that baseball, whatever it is that's falling, baseballs fall at a maximum rate of 74 miles an hour, how fast a baseball can fall. So when, once a baseball gets to 74 miles an hour, uh, it can't go any faster. You go, well, that doesn't make any sense because in baseball, a pitcher can hurl a ball at 92, 93, 94 miles an hour. Well, that's because they rotate it and rotation causes those turbidity currents we talked about and that that um, eddy currents behind the ball which changes the we'll get to this which changes the pressure which then allows the ball to go faster same with the golf ball uh okay but a baseball just being dropped will go at the maximum uh, at atmosphere at at 74 miles an hour so why is that so I want you to see how to go for how, how this may be a question on a test, but you're going to have, you're going to get to use your notes. Aha, you're acing the hole unless you take bad notes. So if you have decent notes, you'll show the derivation. How do we get from here to here? Well, you tell me what's the, what's the problem? What's the problem? How can I get from this orange equation to the black equation? Can you see where it'd be an issue here? Would it be because of the rho? The rho's fine. D rho A, uh, it's called lassoing. You can lasso, those are all constants. We're assuming they're pretty much constants. So I can lasso those three. I'm trying to solve for velocity, right? So I can lasso those three and then bring to the side, they would be as a denominator. The one half on the other side would be a two. That makes sense. But then we got this MG. What? Where did MG come from? Okay, hold on. So now let's look at it. If I drop a ball, uh, when I first drop it, the microsecond after I drop it, all that's on the ball basically is MG, right? That is the force. That is, the, it's a gravity, mass times gravity. Um, and there's no air drag because there's essentially very, very little, say the velocity is 0 0.001 meter a second. So you square it, it's really small. So it doesn't really play a role. But a, a two, say 50 milliseconds later, we're starting to get a little baby, uh, just the tip, a little baby air drag. My MG stays the same. Those are all congruent because my mass didn't change, gravity didn't change. And then let's say 500 milliseconds later, uh, now uh, air drag is fairly substantial. 
that's air drag, RA up, MG down. Once again, MG. Well, once it reaches terminal speed, let's say it takes it, uh, say it takes it three seconds or so. Then at three seconds, then the RA is congruent to the MG. And at that point, the RA doesn't get any bigger. That's called terminal speed or terminal velocity. And you show it as a V with a subscript T, okay? So at that point, you can substitute in MG for uh, RA. So my equation becomes, instead of RA equals one half M, I say MG equals one half D or OA VT. That little subscript T means terminal speed squared. If you don't put the VT, the, the subscript T there, you'd lose points on this one. Because that's only true at terminal velocity. So when you then you solve for VT and you have your equation, that's a famous equation uh, for terminal speed. So you can take this and determine terminal speeds for different objects. Take for instance, and I'll put all this in the notes. Here we go. Take for instance, a skydiver. So a skydiver weighing at about 160 pounds or so, um, area is about point so so about, about 134 miles an hour. That's as fast as a skydiver can fall with that area. Now the skydiver can, if you've ever skydived, I don't know if you guys can, you're old enough yet, I guess. By the way, if you're gonna skydive, I don't wait till you get married and have kids. That's what I did. And then a student of mine, sky, he was gonna take me skydiving and I was all ready to go. And then my insurance guy says, well, that's fine, except that we're not gonna cover you if you have an accident. If you die, uh, we're not going to pay off because there's a clause that you cannot put your own life in danger like that. So go skydive. When you turn 18, go skydive. When you've got no, you know, no one's dependent on your income. Um, anyway, so so a side note there. So, so a diver can go at about 100, without a parachute, about 134 miles an hour. Now it depends, right? When you're skydiving, you can go pin dive, you can do like a pencil, and then you would, you would, you would minimize your A, your profile area, and therefore you dive a little faster. Your terminal speed might be 140 miles an hour or something. But if you lay out your arms like they do, right? They make, they, they try and what they're doing is they're maximizing uh, their air because they want to stay. They don't want to pull the chute. You know, you don't want the parachute to open. You want to have fun up there. So they got to maximize their A. Uh, and then that's going to maximize the air drag, which is then going to um, keep them up longer. Um, but if you're going for pure speed, you want to make a pin out of yourself or a pencil. Uh, OK, and then when the parachute opens up now, I mean, obviously a parachute, you're now you got huge amount of profile area. And that's designed to slow you down to about 15 uh, feet per second rather than 60. Okay. So you cut that by 75% by opening up a parachute. Do, 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 do. You hit the ground at 60, you're probably, although there have been people that have parachutes not opened up and they still lived. Um, one guy hit a, a Soviet, hit a hill. I think a snowy hill and he hit it just right and he slid down the hill and did not die without his parachute. Okay, baseball, like I said, 74 miles an hour, golf ball, 72 miles an hour for a golf ball. That's a, and I hold up my, I don't have my golf balls here, but I hold up a golf ball. That's your typical PGA golf ball with the, with the 330, something like that. It can have a certain amount of divots in it. I think 330, I think is standard. Um, cheaters, uh, Trump is one of them because they found they found that Trump's ball had like 440 <laughs> divots in it. If you have more divots, then you you kicked out of the PGA. But if you have more dig divots, then uh, your ball will be will drive further because part of it is the surface thing we're talking about, which we'll get to in a little bit, or maybe next time. Um, so people that cheat, or if you just out in a weekend, but they can put your ball in a scanner. It can scan those things. They're really hard to count, but it can scan them and you'll be out. So don't, so check your golf ball. 
hailstones. Uh, you're out hailing out there. You're going to hit about 30 miles an hour. Rain, just typical rain, about 20 miles an hour is about as fast as a raindrop, typical raindrop can go. Okay, so that's terminal speed. We want to talk about that. Okay, so we've talked about all that stuff. All right, we keep going back to the free body, then I'll keep going off and talking about this and that. I apologize, but have to do it at some point. So RA is not as long as FP, but it's long. And then there's, now when you draw the friction force, it actually is less. It's smaller, that's counterintuitive. So whatever your friction force was in three, make it smaller in four. Why? Why would friction be less the faster you go? Okay. This comes from, oh, okay. Uh, hold on. Okay, let's go to the Y for a second. Uh, in the Y then, um, we're going to have the normal force, but we also have lift. Lift starts at around 50. There's a baby... At 60, we showed it as a baby, but at 80, you got a decent amount of lift. We'll talk about why you get lift in there. So you get a little bit of lift there. But the thing is, the upward force has to equal the downward force. And so the downward force is set at mg. So the upward force, the normal force has to drop. So normal force looks like that. It's less than it was. So whatever you drew, however long you drew your normal force over here in three, make it shorter and you make it shorter by how much you made the, the force of lift. At 80, force of lift is still pretty small. When you get up to 90, uh, they start to become the same, normal and force of lift. And anything above that, if you've ever driven something at 90, 98, 100 miles an hour, that lift starts to rise. The normal force is the amount of contact you have gets smaller and smaller. Okay. So why does that make friction go down? Uh, what should we talk about first? Um, let's talk about the lift. So I don't know if I did this yesterday, but I take a piece of paper. Oh, okay, that's a test. Oh, it's take on test. If I take a piece of paper and I blow on it, see the way the paper rises like that? You can do this at home. You can't do it in class with COVID. Um, you can do it at home. So you take a piece of paper and then blow over it. Blow so the air goes over the paper. You would think that make the paper go down more, right? Because you're blowing over it, but it makes the paper rise. So the question is, why does air over the top of something make the thing rise? All right. So here we go. Uh, so if I'm blowing, all right. Here I here's my mouth through my nose. Okay, and then I'm blowing my tongue here, and I'm blowing over that paper. So there's the paper. Paper starts off like this. It's just sitting like that, and then as I blow over the top, it rises. So um, let's take a look at why this is. This is why airplanes fly. Basically, this is the idea. Behind how this is like the Daniel Bernoulli thing, right? It's Bernoulli, but Bernoulli is more of a closed system. And we'll get to, I mean, yeah, there is a Bernoulli involved here. You, you're, you're studying uh, fluids, I think, in your class. So Bernoulli's equation, it's involved, but it's not really the Venturi effect because Venturi effect's also a closed system. But let's just, let's, let's go down. We're going more basic than that, okay? Uh, all that's involved. But if I just take typical air molecules, so here I go, air molecules. What time do I got? Okay, I still got 14 minutes. All right. So hold on. I mean, this is interesting. I mean, how how planes fly. I mean, you know, it's, but it's 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 detailed. So I'll try and get it not too detailed, but but a typical air. If before I start blowing on that thing, there's air molecules bouncing off. And basically, what is pressure? Well, pressure is simply force per unit area. And the force, what is the force? Where does air pressure come from? It comes from the force of air molecules. So these are oxygens and nitrogens mostly. And they, they're bouncing off the top of the paper. They're bouncing off the bottom of the paper. Okay. All these, and there's all these diagrams on this stuff. 
is so there's billions of these, right? And so and going at different speeds. Now the average speed and this in a typical classroom is around 800 miles an hour. Uh, these things are moving. We talked about that. Uh, Brownie in motion, right? And they're going in all, and so randomly, but but it's statistics. So statistically, you have so many of them hitting the top of the paper and about an equal amount hitting the bottom of the paper, and the paper just kind of, in this case, the paper just kind of sits there, all right? Not doing anything. Um, but when I blow over the top, I'm taking more of those molecules, more of those oxygen, this, we're talking O2 and, and N2, more of those molecules that would be hitting the paper, I'm now forcing them in this direction. I'm changing the direction of motion a lot of those because I'm just forcing them to go more in this direction. Like whichever way I'm blowing, I'm blowing down the, down the front of the top of the paper. So a lot of these molecules, instead of hitting the paper, they're now being kind of forced to go this way. And so you have less molecules on the top of the paper that's going down the paper than you do below. And so that makes this a high pressure zone, like you'd see on a, on a weather map. You have this instantaneous, and this is a low pressure zone. You have this instantaneous low pressure zone above the paper and high pressure zone below the paper. And so the paper rises, it has no choice. It's getting pushed up by all the molecules below it. Okay, I'll try it again. So. There you go. Saw so a hyperventilator, but but that's that's what's happening. You're seeing that air pressure rise. Uh, air pressure is a is an interesting thing. If you did this in if you did this in ninth, seventh or eighth grade, where they take a can, we should do this in physical science. Take a can, heat the water inside it, and then cap it real quick, like a like a gas can or something, and pretty quickly it goes crunch. It crunches because uh, um, you get less air on the inside. And so all that air pressure, that 2,000 pounds per foot, uh, squeezes that can and smashes it. So same thing with the piece of paper, all those air molecules below that are more of them are going up than going sideways, moves the paper up. So on an airfoil, uh, on a wing, it's the same idea. And I have animations of this. Uh, the, you got you to make the shape of the wing so that the air goes faster over the top. And this has to do with the incidence of hitting and all that and Bernoulli's equation. But the air goes faster over the top and slower over the bottom. And then that's going to make the whole thing lift. You don't want that in a car. But, but it happens because the car's top, you know, kind of looks like an airplane wing. And hold on, I'll show you an airplane wing the kind of the wing I'm talking about. And we'll get to, well, where's it at? Okay, so here's your basic, this is going into a stall. Here we go, here we go. So um, on an airplane wing, the, the, there's a side view of the wing, uh, but it's all, and we'll, we'll get to this whole thing tomorrow, maybe or Thursday, we'll get to this idea of this eddy currents and the drag behind it. Um, but your air, and I'll show an animation of this, the air with uh, this, it's called left, the angle of attack. The air uh, will come over this. It, it has a higher velocity. Uh, so you end up with a low pressure zone on top and a high and relative high pressure zone below a wing. And that allows the air, airplane to fly. Okay. And the angle uh, that the wings, the flaps, all those, all those take it into account. But the basic airfoil shape uh, causes this to happen. Um, a lot of wings are, are kind of curled back a little bit. They have more of a, the shape is more, it comes up and then it kind of curls back a little bit more than this one does. But still, that's the idea is to get the air to have to go further over the top and it goes faster. Uh, the old explanation is conservation of mass, but that's not, that, that's shown to be false um, lately. In the last 10 years. It's just more of, um, ah, well, uh, uh, the animation will show it. This, it all, it's almost as data as empirical. When it gets to fluids, if, if you want to watch some interesting equations, go watch that 
video from yesterday, the, the equations get nasty real fast. Stokes theorem, all these things are just fluid dynamics is a nightmare. Um, staying with the same idea though, this is this this is it's a subset of Bernoulli's equation. This idea of uh, uh, Venturi effect. If you are um, okay, let's say you're 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 watering the yard. And your dad told you to water these flowers. Well, the, the hose is only 50 feet long and the flowers are like 75 feet away. So how do you get the water from the hose to the flowers? Right? I mean, you put your thumb over it, right? So you're instinctively, you already understand the Venturi effect. When you do that, the water velocity increases and the, the water gets to the you know, projectile motion, the water gets to the flowers. But the thing you don't notice is uh, if you put, and I used to do this experiment in class till somebody knocked it over with their backpack, um, but the pressure uh, around that in that high velocity fluid, the pressure drops. So because less of that, in this case, water, it could be air too, less of those molecules are pressing up. And so the level drops. Um, Okay, and I can show you animations of that and videos of that. I'm gonna look for a video today and I'll add that to the comments. Um, so that's called Venturi effect, but that all from, from where that meets us, I mean, why are we talking about all this? Because that causes the car to have lift and the higher the velocity, the more the force of lift. The greater the force of lift, the less contact there is between the two surfaces and therefore the less normal force there is. Well, the formula for friction is, we're almost done here. The formula, for, I, I know this is a lot to take in, I apologize. So my kids in class are like, oh God. But there's just so much to cover in such a short amount of time. So in this, you'll get this as well, but the, but the friction, there's two kinds of friction. There's static friction. Um, mu sub s times n, and there's kinetic friction, mu sub k times n. Now the mu, that comes from chemistry, it's something called uh, London dispersion forces, which we will spend about 20 minutes in class one day talk, uh, in here talking about that. But that comes a little later, there's a sheet on it, you'll see. Um, so that's chemistry. But notice that it also depends on the normal force. Normal force is the amount of contact. Now, static friction looks like this. Two things aren't moving. Kinetic friction, do this with your hands, okay? That's kinetic, that's sli sometimes called sliding friction. And sliding friction produces a lot of heat. You can feel the heat, right? A lot of energy is lost. But, but when you're rolling down the road, and we'll, we'll do the cycloid pattern um, later on this week, probably Thursday, when you're rolling down the road, the tire is not sliding along the road, it's stabbing the road, stabbing the road, stabbing the road. Uh, it was actually Isaac Newton that figured this one, this one out. It's not sliding. I know it says kinetic friction. I think, well, it's moving. No, no, that's actually sliding friction. So uh, for now, just realize that, that, that it makes sense that the more contact you have, the more friction you're going to have. The more, the greater the normal force, the, the harder it's going to be to slide that boulder as opposed to sliding a pebble. And it's just, that's pure, it can both be granite. So the mu sub s is the same, but the normal force is different. So if I can reduce, if I can get this guy to go down, then this guy will go down. And so that's what happens uh, in a car when you have a higher amount of velocity, the normal force goes down, therefore fs also goes down, which is, as we just showed, that is mu sub s times n. Okay. Isn't free body diagrams wonderful? Except that this is this it's expensive. It's 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 expensive. It's expensive on time. Uh, it's it just it takes up a lot of my time. So, but it's important. I mean, this is physics. Uh, this is the gold standard of physics here. So FP minus R A minus Fs, you could say mu sub s times n if you want, equals now we now it's the same equation we had last time, except now it equals max because it is accelerating. 
So this guy's got to be a little bit longer than those, those two back forces combined. This guy, the front force, the forward force. The default is to the right is forward. Okay. I'm about to talk down. I know you stopped listening a while ago. So uh, five and six are your homework. Try those tonight. Uh, they're, they're getting a stamp for it. So you got to keep up. Uh, so, you know, so this thing's ready to go. When I say it's ready to go, I'll say, okay, turn it in. You're ready to turn it in. We're not ready yet. The whole, the back gets more complicated than the front. Uh, but anyway, try five and six tonight. And was there anything else? Oh, one last thing. One last thing uh, before you go. Um, I wanted to point this out. Uh, this is something that I apologize. I, I, I was going through the papers and uh, the, the screenshots for today, and I came across the this history. And history is a huge part of my lesson, my, my curriculum. But I had to make the decision back in September it killed me to drop history. I have about a three gigabyte document with all this history. This goes from uh, the Vietnam War, Korean War to the Vietnam War, and it talks about all the things that were going on in physics. And so we blow stuff up and we look at these and the kids had to know like each test, they had to know like eight of them. And then I would pick from those eight, I'd pick five and we'd ask multiple choice questions about them. Kids liked it because they were a bonus if you got them right. You only missed one point if you lost it. You got two points if you got it right. Bonus. So we talk about the double helix. That was 1953. We would talk about the beginning of nuclear power, which was 1956 in England. We talked about the beginning of fiber optics, which was 1953. They just set the fiber optic cable in my neighborhood a couple of days ago. But that we we started using fiber optics back in 1953. So. You know, we're talking 47, 57, 67, 70 years ago. We've known about fiber optics. We're just now starting to use it more. Uh, and then this talks about fiber optics. So, so that history would go from 1495 in September up to the year 2100 in May. We do the entire, and then we go to the future. And every, every day we do a little more history. So I dropped all that. And we're still a month behind. I don't get it. Well, for one thing, I'm losing my Wednesdays. It doesn't help. All right, so tomorrow we lose you, but uh, we'll get back together. We will meet tomorrow, uh, those that want to come. We'll, we'll watch this video on fluid dynamics, and I'll stop it and pause it and talk about it, okay? All right, so uh, I'm done, and you guys can go. If you have a question, stick around. I was taking that. Yeah, I was taking it. Good. If you have a question, stick around. Otherwise... See you Thursday. Oh, tomorrow. Tomorrow.